let's now discuss homeostasis, which is the tendency towards internal balance. So homeostasis is the existence of a stable internal environment. The body demonstrates homeostasis when its needs are being adequately met and it's functioning smoothly. In other words, that we're healthy. The fact that we're healthy and we're free of any diseases, that means homeostasis is working. We have the existence of a stable internal environment. So the body systems have to work together to maintain the stable internal environment, whereby they respond to external and internal changes to function within a normal range. The analogy that I like to use when discussing homeostasis is imagine that you are on a plank of wood that's resting on a ball and at the same time you're juggling a bunch of balls in the air. So the idea here is to not drop any of the balls and to not fall off the plank. So this is essentially what's going on most of the time in the background. We're not aware of homeostasis. And again, this is an analogy of homeostasis. You don't want to do some type of major movement whereby you shift all your body weight to the right because chances are you're going to fall off the plank and then drop the balls. Nor do you want to shift all your body weight to the left either. So the idea is you want to maintain that stability, right? You want to maintain being balanced on that plank of wood while you're juggling a bunch of balls in the air. So in order to do that, you make small, fine adjustments. You, so you slightly shift your body weight maybe to the right, to the left, and you have to do this continually. It's not like you, you can just stand there completely still. Otherwise, guess what? You're going to fall off. And if we fall off the plank of wood, that means homeostasis is no longer being maintained, which means we get sick. And worse yet, we potentially can die. The same thing when you're juggling these balls in the air, your arms have to constantly move, right? Small movements so that the balls remain suspended in the air. And this, again, is what the body's doing 24-7 day and night. Because of this, sometimes we refer to homeostasis as being dynamic equilibrium. The idea is you make small, fine adjustments. You're not completely still. Because if you're still, then we don't refer to it as dynamic. So the term dynamic means changes. The fact that we're remaining balanced on that plank of wood while we're juggling a bunch of balls is the equilibrium. So I want you to think of homeostasis as internal stability whereby you make small fine adjustments. That way we maintain this stable internal environment. With homeostatic regulation, this involves adjustment of physiological systems to maintain homeostasis. And as I just said, most of the time, we're not aware that this is happening. So this is happening all the time. Otherwise, we'll end up getting sick and worse yet, we die. So homeostatic regulation consists of three components. So we have what's called the receptor, we have what's called the control center, and we have what's called the effector. But before we go into the discussion of these three components and how they come together, let's define stimulus. So stimulus is anything that invokes a specific reaction or a response. So if we're reacting to it, then that's referred to as the stimulus, right? That's causing that reaction. So the first component of homeostatic regulation is the receptor. So the receptor is the receiving end. It's the sensor. It's there sensing the stimulus, which by the way, if we use the word stimulus, that means singular. And if there's two or more, then we will use the word stimuli. So stimuli is the plural form and stimulus is the singular form. So here's this receptor, once again, that I like to refer to as the sensor. It's there sensing the stimulus. And if it reacts, then the idea is it's going to send what we call input or afferent signals. Now I need you to memorize this, okay? So input equals afferent. We're just gonna use the word signals for now. We'll define exactly what signals are later. So if the receptor is sensing that change and reacts to it, it's now going to send that input signal, that afferent signal, to the second component of homeostatic regulation, which is the control center. So the control center 
is going to receive that input afferent signal. It's going to process that signal. And the idea is it generates, hopefully, the appropriate output. So that output we refer to as efferent. Once again, we'll just say signal. Signal we'll define later. So output equals efferent. So where is that output efferent signal going to? Well, it's going to the third component of homeostatic regulation called the effector, or if it's plural, effectors. So bottom line, an effector is going to receive that output efferent signals being sent to it by the control center. And if it responds to it, then it's defined as the effector. So an effector could be a gland, it could be a tissue, it could be an organ. As long as it responds and carries out the instructions that it's receiving from the control center, then we refer to that as the effector. Now, I quickly want to mention something as far as a lot of these uh, symbols that I use so you don't get confused. So if I use the plus symbol, I'm not talking about positive ions, cations. I mean to say stimulates enhances. If you see a negative symbol, I'm not talking about anions or negative ions. What I'm referring to is inhibition. It depresses. So until I tell you otherwise, this is what these symbols mean. So if we go back to the response, right, right here. So I have here the minus. So let's look at this negative symbol here, which again means inhibition or depresses. So in other words, if the response of the effector will inhibit or will depress the stimulus, will negate the stimulus, then that's part of what we call the negative feedback loop. So what does this exactly mean? So let's say the stimulus is high body temperature. So through negative feedback, it negates that. It counteracts that. It goes against it. In other words, we drop the body temperature through negative feedback. If something is too low, so if we have low body temperature as the stimulus, through negative feedback, the idea is to increase the body temperature. So with negative feedback, ladies and gentlemen, the response of the effector negates the stimulus. It counteracts the stimulus. If something is too high, through negative feedback, we bring it back down. If something is too low, through negative feedback, we bring it back down up. Bottom line, folks, the body is brought back to homeostasis. Normal range is achieved. Now, we also have what's called positive feedback. So let's talk about that. So with positive feedback, notice I use the plus sign. What we have here is we add on to the stimulus, all right? We're exaggerating the response. We increase the change of the stimulus. So with positive feedback, we are moving away from homeostasis. Furthermore, normal range is lost. So the whole purpose of positive feedback is to speed things up, to make things go faster. So if we compare the two, which would we have more of? Well, it turns out most of the feedback that we see is negative. So most of the time, homeostasis involves negative feedback rather than positive feedback, because I hope you see with positive feedback, we're going away from homeostasis. So a good example of positive feedback is during delivery. So for those of you all who have given birth, the closer you get to delivery of your child, your baby, the contraction intensifies. It gets stronger and stronger. Furthermore, the frequency increases as well. That's positive feedback. Because if it were negative feedback, if you have a contraction, then through negative feedback, you're going to counteract that. Then the co contraction goes away. Well, clearly, this is not what we want to have happen because the idea is to deliver the baby. So what we have is positive feedback where we speed up the process because the ultimate goal is to deliver your child. So let's now discuss negative feedback loop. A classic example that's often used when negative feedback is discussed is thermal regulation. Basically, this means the regulation of body temperature. So normal body temperature fluctuates. It ranges between 37.2 degrees Celsius to 37.2 degrees Celsius. Celsius is the metric system. 
We can also say 98.4 degrees Fahrenheit to 98.9 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the English system. So the term set point is a physiological value around which the normal value fluctuates. It is an ideal number for a specific physiological process. What that means is if you think back to that analogy of you being on the plank of wood that's resting on the ball while you're simultaneously juggling a bunch of balls in the air. So the idea, once again, is to remain balanced, right? You make fine, small adjustments so that way we don't fall off the plank of wood and drop the balls. So essentially, the fluctuation is that small, fine-tuned movements that you're making so that you remain balanced, so you remain on that plank of wood. That normal range that you see, the values that we just discussed, that's the fluctuation. That's where you make the small, fine-tuned movements. So this set point is at 37 degrees Celsius. So please note the y-axis is body temperature. So this is in Celsius. So this 37 degrees Celsius is the set point. It's that plank of wood that's resting on that ball. And you making small fine-tune adjustments, once again, is the fluctuations. Now look at the difference between 37.2 degrees and 37. So it's not significant, folks. We're looking at a temperature difference of 0.2 degrees Celsius. So this is where if it goes up by so much as 0.2, immediately homeostasis kicks in, whereby we bring that temperature back down. Now, if we look at 36.7 degrees, that's a difference of 0.3 degrees. So once again, if the temperature goes below 37, immediately homeostasis kicks in to bring it back up. So we're not waiting for some type of dramatic temperature change here. It's not like it's where the body's waiting for a full degree Celsius change. It's just a very small temperature change, enough for homeostasis to kick in. And again, this goes back to the analogy. I keep going back to it so you can get a visual on it. So you're making small adjustments. So those fluctuations, normal range. So here's another image showing this. So once again, that set point, you can think of the plank of wood resting on the ball, and that small adjustments that you're making is the normal range. And take note once again of the temperature difference that hovers around the set point. Small changes to maintain balance, to maintain internal stability. So let's look at the diagram that I did to the right. Okay, so here you are you're under the sun. So the heat of the sun is causing our body temperature to go up. So our body temperature will go up. This is the stimulus caused by the heat of the sun. So we have receptors called thermoreceptors. So if you look at the word thermoreceptors, thermo means temperature. Receptors is receptors, the first component of homeostatic regulation. So these thermoreceptors are there sensing they're, they're picking up the increase in body temperature because that's what these receptors are designed to do. Now, one thing I want to point out about these receptors. These receptors are very specific as far as the stimulus they detect. So when we say thermal receptors, that means these receptors are specific as far as body temperature is concerned. They're not there to detect other changes. They're not there to detect other stimuli. So we find these thermoreceptors internally and externally. So when the body temperature goes up and now it's sending input afferent signals to the brain. So we'll put here input afferent. So these input or afferent signals are being sent to the brain, a specific part of the brain called the hypothalamus. So the brain, ladies and gentlemen, is the second component of homeostatic regulation. It is the control center. So this brain is receiving input afferent signals that's being sent to it by these thermoreceptors. So please note, in this particular example, the brain is the control center. Does it always have to be the brain? No, it does not. It just so happens when it comes to thermoregulation, the brain is the control center. 
So the brain will now process that information and will generate an output signal. And of course, we call that output signal efferent. So it generates an output signal called efferent. So this output efferent signals are being sent to the effectors, which are the sweat glands and the blood vessels found in the skin. So we'll go ahead and put a number three here to indicate that these are the effectors, the third component of homeostatic regulation. So what are these effectors going to do? Because the brain, the control center, is sending these output efferent signals, and it's going to tell these effectors, I need you to do the following. So in the case of increase in body temperature, what the sweat glands will do is it'll increase sweat. All right, so more sweat is being produced. So why do we increase sweat production? Well, this goes back to something that you may have discussed back in 189 called evaporative cooling. Let's say this is your skin, okay? And now you produce sweat. So this is sweat because your sweat glands were told to produce sweat. So sweat is mostly water. And as the water evaporates, okay, the sweat evaporates, heat is released. So this is called evaporative cooling. So the heat dissipates. And the idea is to take the heat away from our skin because the premise is to decrease the body temperature. Remember, this is negative feedback. So this works great in a very dry climate like Vegas because the air is so dry, the evaporative cooling is so much more efficient. We lose that sweat, we lose that heat, and we have greater relief versus if we were, let's say, in the swamps of Louisiana in the middle of summer. So if we live in a very humid climate where there's a lot of water, a lot of moisture in the atmosphere, this evaporative cooling isn't so great. This is why you can't seem to get relief in the middle of summer when it's extremely humid. It's better in a dry climate like ours. It's even better when there's wind. So wind is blowing, this definitely takes that heat away and the sweat evaporates and we feel so much more comfortable. So what about our blood vessels? The second effector in this whole thermal regulation. So blood vessels, once again, skin. I wanna emphasize we're looking at the blood vessels in the skin. Now, before we get into the details of blood vessels, I made some illustrations here because this is all related to what we're going to discuss. So here's my illustration of a blood vessel, okay? And the area that I colored in green is referred to as the lumen. So the lumen is the inside space. It's that hollow cavity. And of course, what we find in this inside space, the hollow cavity that we call the lumen is blood. Again, this is an illustration of a blood vessel. So the distance from one end to the next is referred to as the diameter. Now, if we use the term vasodilation, which I absolutely need you to know, what that means is the diameter of the blood vessel, the diameter of the lumen of this blood vessel will increase. So in other words, it gets wider. And if it gets wider because of vasodilation, we have an increase in the diameter, then more blood flows through that blood vessel because you've opened up the blood vessel, right? By vasodilating, you've increased the diameter. On the flip side, we have what's called vasoconstriction. So with vasoconstriction, the diameter of the blood vessel decreases. It becomes more narrow. So if it becomes more narrow, less blood is going to flow through that blood vessel. So please know these terms. All right, so how does this relate to blood vessels in the skin? Well, it turns out the brain will tell the blood vessels in the skin, I need you to vasodilate, All right? So vasodilation will happen. So why? Why vasodilate? Because the idea is that by vasodilating and more blood flows through these blood vessels of the skin, we can radiate out that heat like a radiator or a space heater. If you've ever looked at a space heater and you turn it on, it gets red and you feel that heat, right? So essentially that's kind of like what's going on with our blood vessels. 
So if we vasodilate, our blood vessels become wider, more blood flows through that, and more heat is lost. And in fact, if you have someone who is standing outside in the middle of summer, and they come inside, you don't even need to touch them. You just stand close to them and you can feel their body heat. Because of this vasodilation, more blood flow through the blood vessels of their skin. It's like they're a radiator. And sometimes they may even appear flush. So what's the objective? What are these effectors trying to do? Well, it's trying to counteract. It's trying to negate, go against the stimulus. In other words, what it's trying to do is to decrease the body temperature. This is the whole idea of negative feedback. Okay, now what about if we were out in the middle of winter? Okay, so what if we were standing outside and it's extremely cold? So now it's winter time. So now your body temperature is gonna go down. Okay, so that's the stimulus, decrease body temperature. Well, these thermal receptors are gonna pick that up. That's what they're designed for, right? They're specifically designed to sense changes in body temperature. So what do they do? Well, they're gonna send input afferent signals to the brain, the control center, for thermal regulation. So the brain's gonna process that information, send out output efferent signals to the effectors, which are the sweat glands and the blood vessels in the skin. So what's the brain going to tell the sweat glands to do? The last thing it's gonna tell the sweat glands to do is to produce more sweat. Why? Because we don't wanna lose more body heat, right? We're in the middle of winter, we're standing outside. So what it's gonna tell the sweat glands to do, do not produce sweat. We do not need evaporative cooling. We do not need to lose more body heat. What about the blood vessels in the skin? What's the brain gonna tell those blood vessels of the skin to do? Well, it's gonna tell the blood vessels, I need you to vasoconstrict. Why? Because by vasoconstricting, the less blood is gonna flow through those blood vessels, therefore less heat is lost. Hence, when someone comes in from the cold, they seem pale. They don't seem to have much color in their skin because of vasoconstriction. So the idea is to increase the body temperature. It's counteracting, negating the stimulus.